Hello everyone, I'm Amani Sawari, and this is another presentation about how people in prison process their conditions while incarcerated with an art form that's the most accessible to people in prison, which is pencil drawings. We know as humans, we all need the freedom of expression, but without freedom of movement and with very little freedom of communication with the outside world, here are some unique ways that people in prison have been able to break through those barriers. So the first thing that I want to focus on is how people in prison have been able to illustrate the unjust elements of our criminal injustice system, also known as the criminal legal system. In this drawing, which is a pencil drawing that was sent to me in support of a fundraiser that I was doing, to allow people in prison to earn time off of their sentences in 2019 and 2020. This person drew this for an art auction and this piece actually sold for the most at that fundraiser. And this piece just really illustrates how different marginalized communities are treated by the prison industrial slave complex, but more so the judicial system, how the judicial system fails certain groups of people, including wrongful convictions, which Michigan has the highest percentage of wrongful convictions in the country. But we all know that having little to no money, poverty crimes is a huge crime that happens as well as not being able to proficiently speak English and if you're Black, that's just the cherry on top. I did a full breakdown of this piece in one of my 10 in the Pin series videos. So I will link that in the description if folks want to go in depth of a few full reflection on this piece. There's also more elements um, in, on the perimeter. Like you can see the full sitting um, committee of people and all their facial expressions a little bit better in that video. So make sure to check it out. The reason why the system doesn't work very well is because biases prevail and there's no way to measure implicit bias in a system that was built on racism. I got this comment in my last video presentation of the prisoner submitted content that Sawari Media works with. And I am, I guess pleased, but also shocked that the rhetoric, if you did the crime, do the time, is still so popular. I haven't heard it in a really long time. But this is also the first, that was also the first of this series. And I just wanted to respond to that. Crimes are shaped and are identified by the judiciary system, really the, the legislative system which has a lot of implicit biases. Our constitution is full of implicit biases. It includes a carve out for slavery. If, if that doesn't call out the fact that implicit bias exists within our criminal system, then you must be racist or ignorant because it's very racist that chattel-based slavery was legal for so long and no one ever was sentenced or served any time for that, even though it was humanely genocidal and a, a crime against humanity. But the way that we shape crimes in our system, especially in this corporate democracy, there's a lack of consideration for the environmental impacts that contribute to someone's behavior. And a lot of the time, an environmental impact, I'd say 99% of the time, is poverty. If someone had the resources that they need, especially financial resources, then they wouldn't resort to a lot of the crimes that they resort to, whether that's stealing, you look at things, the items that people have stolen, things for their children, food, diapers, like people are stealing Similac because they need it, not because it's just fun or they have, you know, some vendetta against the company. And there's also this notion of preconceived guilt just based upon how someone looks or how someone functions in society. And then, of course, our system with this do the crime, do the time mindset, even though time, you can't really measure 
You can't rationalize a behavior with how much time you take away from someone's life. But when we don't consider the environmental impacts and we have this preconceived notion of guilt, then it's really easy to forget about those things. So I won't read this letter. I'm sure you've read through it a little bit, but you can definitely pause the video if you want to get more perspective. This is a letter that was sent from an incarcerated subscriber letting us know about how implicit biases contributed to his inability and Minnie's inability to access parole. And that was from Missouri. Next, people in prison are using artwork to criticize the conditions of prison as it relates to useless protocols like count time. I also did an in-depth reflection on this piece, which was drawn by an incarcerated artist in California. But if you don't know what count time is, it's the daily or even hourly practice of doing a head count of every single person inside of the prison that is incarcerated. And so it really depends on the prison how often this count time occurs. But regardless, if you're in solitary confinement, if you're in the general population, if you're in the chow hall, or if everyone's on lockdown, there is a count at a specific time of day where everyone has to really just present themselves in front of the CO that's literally doing a head count. And that practice really, it, while it does give us the satisfaction that no one's attempted to escape in the past hour or 24 hours it doesn't meet any of the other human needs that people in prison experience so if we go back to this photo the people in prison themselves are drowning in the conditions whether it's like mold infestation not being able to earn a living wage not being able to find a nutritious meal not being able to afford to send a letter to their mother not being able to afford to send or call their sister to tell them happy birthday not being able to attend their grandfather's funeral these are all situations that people my readers have expressed to me none of those needs are being met but they're physically present. And it's a useless piece of protocol that people in prison feel doesn't address any of their actual needs. This, the, this section really focuses on this idea of political hopelessness. And these drawings really hit me. The first drawing is an illustration of really the mental capacity of what happens when someone is incarcerated. There's a lot going on in the mind. There's a lot of distractions in the environment. And there's a lot of dehumanizing acts that take place. This drawing is much larger. I might find the time to do a reflection on this piece, but there's just so many things going on. And you can see like from spiritual elements taking over his thoughts, to the memory of, let's say it's a child, maybe it's a niece, nephew, when well, it's not a nephew, it looks like a young girl, but maybe it's a niece, their memory of them, you know, the, the thought of disappointing family, the amount of time that's passing, all of this happening, and there not being any resolve. And then I really, really love this drawing of Obama. If you guys don't recognize who this is, I do honor the former president for the representation that he was able to provide in his family and his marriage and his seat during his time serving as the commander in chief. However, he spent a lot more time pondering on what could be done for marginalized communities, African-American communities, than he did actually doing. And as you can see, he's sitting on a inflamed earth while thinking about the largest threats or perceived larger threats, um, foreign uh, threats, I guess, rather than like what's going on domestically which is a criticism that people in prison had. Here I list some devastating policies and you'll see if you wanna pause, you can read this letter from an incarcerated person talking specifically about ADEPA, but other policies that have devastated and caused overcrowding in the prison system include mandatory minimum sentence policies, like truth and sentencing and gang enhancement laws. 
So as we go into the last section, this is huge, especially during the Black August, August season, Black August solidarity with anyone who's commemorating this time with me, but it's the exploitation of prison labor. There are, as we all know, different types of jobs in prison that include maintaining the prison itself, like kitchen, laundry, janitorial, but people may not know that prisoners are also recruited to provide very low cost labor to very rich, wealthy, profitable corporations that don't necessarily function for the benefit of the prison system and that don't serve prisoners at all. This drawing was drawn by someone incarcerated in Washington State, illustrating the job that people in prison would often perform, which is packaging coffee beans, usually during the Christmas season. And that's what they would do for Starbucks. During the 2018 National Prison Strike, it was exposed that Starbucks was one of the exploiters of labor in the region. And there were protests outside of their stores that occurred as a result of that in support of people in prison earning a living wage. But there are hundreds of other companies. And I'll actually list a resource um, in the description for you all with a database of companies. Um, shout out to Worth Rises and the incredible work that they did. Oh, you guys, I spelled exploitation wrong. Please forgive me. You'll probably see one typo in each of these. Whoever catches a typo, if you want to call me out, then I will... <laughs> I might even send you a gift because you're paying attention and you made it to the end of this video. So abolishing the 13th Amendment has been the call in this movement to end the exploitation of slave labor because the 13th Amendment literally has a clause in it that says slavery is not okay except for in the cases when people are being punished for a crime. And we don't think slavery is okay in any way. It's always gonna be inhumane, whether someone has been identified as a criminal or not, whether someone's participating in a specific activity or not, they can be rehabilitated in a way that's actually humane rather than being punished meaninglessly. And that, is a presentation on the different ways that people in prison have been able to use pencil drawings to address their conditions while in a state of incarceration in the United States. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.